Thank you so much, Lacey and Rosie and Rory. That is beautiful. Well, it's so wonderful to come to worship and to open His Word again and to study. And I invite you to bow your heads with me as we begin. Oh, Lord, it is so good to worship here you, to know that you are here in our midst, to hear those songs of praise that we join our hearts and our souls with, and know that you hear us, that you hear those testimonies, that you hear the prayers, that you hear the joys and the heartaches, and that you come down to us and so close with us. And now as we open your word, we want you to continue to guide us with your spirit so that we can be transformed and changed and equipped as we move forward. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. It's so good to celebrate the Sabbath. We know that God has created this whole week. He told us to work the six days, so we do, but we can't wait till it's Friday because the Sabbath is almost here, right? And the fri- Friday comes, we're ready for that Sabbath, and on this day that God has set aside, we can, we can set the world aside. We can focus on the worship with Him, even if our to-do list is still long, We can stop, we can rejuvenate, we can be uplifted, we can be rested, we can be spiritually strengthened and energized. Then, unfortunately, there is sunset again on Sabbath, and the new day starts. Sunday, and then Monday, and we don't know what the next day holds. We don't know if the boss is going to... Um, reprimand you for something. Maybe your two-year-old will throw a tantrum that will push all your buttons. Maybe that noise the car was making will turn out to be a big bill. How do you know that you have enough spiritual strength to face tomorrow? How do you know that you will be strong enough to face the unknowns of the next day? You come to God's church, you know that it is His movement of the last day. You come on the day that He set aside, that He blessed. You come regularly, you come every week. Would that give you enough strength to face tomorrow, to face the week, to face unknowns of the week? Maybe in this week you will receive a bad news from a doctor. Maybe a sad news about a loved one, a relative. How do you know you have enough spiritual strength to face it? You open your Bible, those ancient words as you have been singing, and you read those every day. You treasure every word that is there. That gives you strength. You drop on your knees and you pray, and you receive the Holy Spirit every day, But that would that give you enough strength so you can face every day? What if it's not just the day? What if it's been weeks that you have been facing? Maybe you're single and loneliness is eating at you. Maybe you're struggling with the sense of purpose, sense of belonging. How do you know that you're spiritually strong enough to continue to face those things? Maybe you volunteer in the community, in the kitchen. Maybe you, you do some work of evangelism. You're involved in the church, involved in the ministry. Will all those things give you enough strength to face a known face today, face tomorrow, face the next week, the next month? Maybe it's been a year, like one of my good friends from high school. Last year, a wife came to him, says, I don't love you. I've been cheating on you. I don't want anything to do with you or your God. Divorce. Separate custody of the kids. Empty home. Broken heart. Everybody says, Happy New Year. He's not sure how to cope with this year to come. How do you know you have enough strength 
to face tomorrow, face the unknown. How do you do it? You go to church, you pray, you read the Bible, you volunteer, you evangelize. Does it mean that you should have enough strength to face it? How do you know you have enough? Well, maybe, maybe that's the wrong question to ask. Is there something else that we have missed? Is there something else that we have dismissed that God has provided for us? God is the one who designed us how we are to work socially, how we are to, to live emotionally, how we are to work every day, every life, how we are even to face the unknowns and the attacks of Satan every day. Has he provided something for us that we can face tomorrow? Looking at our great example, Jesus, how did he Worship. How did he minister? How did he work and minister day by day? Well, we know one thing, right? That he came either to the synagogue or the temple. That's something that he used to do and done regularly. One of those verses is in Luke chapter 4, verse 16. Luke chapter 4, verse 16. It reads, So he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as his what? Custom. What is custom? A habit, right? Something that you do regularly. He went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. So it was a model that he demonstrated through his life. That's what his disciples have done. That's what others have done before him. They made that habit and they went and worshiped together corporately, whether in synagogue or, um, uh, or in the temple. So how did the process of discipleship work then with Jesus? So he prayerfully went around, he called Peter, he called Andrew, he called others, he collected the 12, and then as all of their habit was, they would go into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And then after a good service, Jesus would turn to Peter and say, Peter, you said that you can beat John next Sabbath to the synagogue and come first. Well, if you do, make sure to reserve the 13 seats for us, and we will see you next Sabbath. And have a good week. See you next Sabbath. Is that how the process worked? No. How did that work then? They ate together, right? They walked together. They were caught up in the storms together. They prayed together. They learned together. They ministered together day by day. They had time and space to build those relationships together. That's important, right? So don't just come to the meetings. Don't miss that Taco Tuesday either. So come together. So how long did it, did it take for Jesus to make the disciples? Three and a half years, right. So it takes time to develop that. And Jesus spent more time with his 12 disciples than he did with the multitude. He spent more time with his 12 disciples than he did with the 70. So why spend so much time with the 12? Did everybody need to hear what he shared with the 12? Yes, for sure. So why spend so much time with them? God could have help people to develop technology before Jesus came, right? To develop cell phones and TVs and everything. And by the time Jesus would have come, they would, could have had YouTube and TikTok. And can you imagine, like, lazing Lazarus from the dead? And number one rated on TikTok, you know, <laughs> Sermon on the Mount, most followers on YouTube. And that would have been great. More people would have heard it that way. And that's an important part of it, to use everything that we have to share the message with as many as possible. But is that how the disciples are made? No. So Jesus wanted to not just to share the message, but to develop the disciples. 
So why was he doing it in that way? Was it just important to develop just those 12 apostles so they can do the work after he's gone? Yes, definitely, that was important. But did the model change of growth of discipleship after Jesus ascended? Did that change? No, that didn't change. I love reading the book of Acts because it demonstrates to us how to live out the Gospels that are recorded for us in the New Testament. So God demonstrates for us in that record of the acts of the Holy Spirit as they followed what they have learned from Jesus that is recorded in the gospel. So the church moves forward and they act. And just this very last Wednesday, uh, Wednesday night in prayer meeting, we actually looked at these two verses in Acts chapter 2, verse 46 and 47. Acts 2, verse 46 and 47. And it reads, so continuing daily with one accord in where? In the temple and breaking bread from house to house. So both things are mentioned, right? Both things are important. So it's not just one or the other, but both. So the church is kind of created with two wings, and it needs to use it in order to fly high and fly straight. So in the temple and house to house. And they ate their food with gladness, probably good food as young adults, and Greg has in his house, and the, the simplicity of heart. And what was the result, as we read in verse 47? Praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So this was a model not just that Christ demonstrated, but that the church continued moving forward. And that was the power of growth of the church, of sharing, of moving forward. And that's not the only example. We see the examples all throughout the scripture and so many in the book of Acts as well of using those two wings as a church to continue to move forward. Acts 5.42, for example, it says, and daily in the temple and in Every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. So in the temple and in every house, they continued to worship together. So we, we talked before about the temple and the importance of that, and we'll talk about it more as well, of coming together corporately to worship uh, as the church. But our focus today will be more on the second part of house to house. We also read in Acts chapter 2, two verse 20, again, the same principle is repeated. It reads, how I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you what? publicly and from house to house. Again, this model continues. So God who created us and knows everything about us designed us to worship in the temple and house to house, to fulfill the commission, to fulfill the purpose of worshiping in the temple and house to house, to fulfill, uh, to fulfill um, uh, our purpose uh, and our mission to evangelize in the temple and house to house. So it's not even a new model that came after Jesus, but we read that also in the Old Testament. Uh, for example, do you remember how Moses, he divided people by thousands and hundreds and fifties and tens, right? So there were small groups, small cells that can come together and they can worship and they can live out their lives together. We also see that in the Adventist movement, as it started, and God has empowered this movement from the prophecy and with the Holy Spirit, and he reminded the movement about also these, this very principle. May I read you a couple of quotes, one from Testimony to the Church, Volume 7, page 21 and 22. It says, the formation of small companies as the basis of Christian effort has been presented to me by the one who cannot err. 
so the foundation of small companies, those small groups. Another quote is also from, from the same volume, uh, page 195. It reads, let small companies assemble in the evening, at noon, or in the early morning, morning to study the Bible. Let them have a season of prayer that they may be strengthened, enlightened, and sanctified by the Holy Spirit, even if it's 6 o'clock in the morning. Let each tell his experience in simple words. This will bring more comfort and joy to the soul than all the pleasant instruments of music that could be brought into the church. Christ will come into your hearts, but it is by the, this means only that you can maintain your integrity. Like Greg was sharing, you need somebody on the end of that rope, right? Because we need that to maintain our integrity, to have accountability with one another. So what are small groups? Well, small groups are generally between three people and 12 people. Don't try to think that you're greater than Christ and have tried to, to have more than 12 people. So between 3 and 12 people. And if you get to 13, don't just tell people you can't come. But that means that's time to multiply the group. So you multiply. You, you help another leader in that group and encourage them to start another group. And you multiply that group and now you have two groups going on. What makes a small groups true holistic small groups to fulfill the purpose that Christ has designed? There's many books, and even this week as I was preparing for the sermon, I opened up some of my seminary books and took the whole semester in holistic small groups, and they write down different things. It seems like each one kind of emphasizes slightly different, but kind of generally all the same. Um, in um, our uh, implementation team that we are studying, I like how he brings it just to three points, and I'll mention those from that book. It says... Our minds are stimulated, our hearts are warmed, and our hands are activated. So in order to be a holistic small group, it needs to have those three components in it. So our minds are stimulated, our hearts are warmed, and our hands are activated. What does it mean? Well, let's try to break it down. Our minds are stimulated. Well, as we look at Acts chapter 2, and we look at this new church that was thriving and going forward, and we read Acts chapter 2, for example, verse 42. It reads, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayer. So they continued in apostles' doctrine. What do you think the apostles were teaching? About Christ, right? So they were teaching the teachings of the Bible. So another word for doctrine is teaching. So they continued to dig in the word and, and share it with people so that people can understand it, internalize it. They would know the right way to go. I pray for every person who preaches here in this church, and I appreciate your prayers as well for the guidance of the Holy Spirit, what, what to preach every Sabbath. But as we get together in the small groups, we're able to, to dig deep in some of the aspects of your life that you need to find answers in Scripture and to break those down in the small groups as well, have opportunity to ask questions and study those as well. So our minds are stimulated. So we study the scripture. And then our hearts are warmed. As we read in Acts 2, in our prayer meeting, um, we read, um, and you can read that whole chapter for yourself, you see the words like fellowship and breaking bread together and praying together. And for all, they were all of one mind and in one accord so there's a lot of fellowship that was going on. So it's a safe place where people can be themselves and not feel condemned. It is a place to grow in Christ in the atmosphere of love and acceptance. 
So like young adults, they can send each other texts, right? I'm struggling with this. I'm down. I need some support. Can you help me? So that's a place where they can share safely. Receive that support, that encouragement. Really have an opportunity to share deep struggle, to carry for one another's burden, to take time to find that out. Because unless we are part of it, if we show up, then we won't be able to share. People won't know what's in our hearts, right? Because I'm thinking also, for example, as we read in the Bible about the paralytic that had four friends that carried him and lowered him through the roof and lowered him to Jesus. Now, if I haven't had spent time with that paralytic and haven't talked to him, what uh, do you think would come to my mind and maybe to yours mind? What is his greatest need? Healing. To walk, right? Probably his greatest need is to walk. But as we read through the story and Jesus knowing his heart, what was his greatest need? Forgiveness. Forgiveness. He wanted to be forgiven more than anything. In fact, God and Christ did that first, and then just to prove to the Pharisees that that act was completed, that's why he healed him. But the greatest need was forgiveness. So it is with us. You know, we don't have time. We love to fellowship. The church that fellowships and, uh, and congregates together after service. We have potlucks. We have that time, and I love that time in our church but there is no real time to share what is deep in our hearts. That can only happen in the small group. So, when Ellen White wrote about the small group, uh, the, the phrase that she used the most is not actually small group, but social meetings. Because her primary focus and emphasis of the small groups or the social meetings was not even the Bible study, although that she never... Uh, uh, lowered that, uh, that principle or the need for that. But we can do Bible study on our own. She emphasized a lot about the Sabbath schools that we can come together and study. And that also can be a big part of the small group. But the biggest part is the social aspect, connecting heart to heart. As we read through her writings, there's actually four things that had to happen in the social meeting or the small group in order for, for that to be the really social meeting. They shared their testimonies. They shared prayers. They had accountability, as Greg talked about, and they sang songs. So those are four things that were must in, in the social group that they have done. So then it really touches and warms the heart as we connect on that heart level with one another. So our minds are stimulated, our hearts are warmed, and then, number three, our hands are activated. We don't just meet for the purpose of ourselves, but in order to serve others. As we read already in Acts chapter 2, verse 47, praising God and having what? Favor with all people. Now, if they were just an exclusive club and didn't reach out to people, would they have favor with all the people? No, they wouldn't. But they reached out and they ministered not just to each other, but also to others as well. So as we meet in our small groups, we support each other, but we also think of how we can outreach, do outreach to the world, to our community, to our neighbors. So it was uh, doing that then, and, uh, and our early movement that was, was happening uh, also through the small groups process. Let me read you last quote from uh, that volume, Testimony to the Church, volume 7. It reads, if there is a large number in the church, let the members be formed into small companies. Why? To work not only for the church members, but for the unbelievers. So that's one of the purposes as well of the small group. So we can think of not just what we can do as the church collectively, some big events, but also think of our neighbor next to us, how we can help them and get together with a small group and help them. 
And remember also when Christ divided up the disciples and sent them two by two, what did they go out and do? They preached and healed, right? And healed people. So they shared the message and they healed people, ministered to the needs of the people. So we do the same. As you know, this, this is part of our series uh, that we were doing. So this is sermon number six of revitalizing the church as we look at the natural church development process. And we're looking at eight characteristics that if all eight are good, then the church will grow naturally. And uh, we are focusing with uh, our team on the least one that we scored. And we'll be talking about that uh, soon is March. And we're, we are progressing forward and moving forward with that. I'm excited to share with you when we'll get to that. Uh, but we want to look at all aspects, and that's why we have this series. And today we are looking at the holistic small groups. And uh, how do you think we score? The average score, as I have mentioned before, 50 is the average score of all the churches in North America. So they took that as kind of a middle score. So if you score above 50, you're doing better than just the average church. If you score below, you're doing worse than just the average church. Uh, looking at... Um, um, all the churches uh, in the Adventist churches. Unfortunately, this is our lowest score of the average Adventist churches uh, that we get from all the eight categories. Um, the, um, the average score in the Adventist churches is 46.5 in the category of the small groups. It's the lowest out of uh, all eight. So three years ago, together with the leaders, we were praying what to do, and God has put it on my heart as well to, to make it on kind of a year of small groups, and we did the training together uh, for, for several months, and we came together with new leaders, with those who are already leading, and uh, God has helped us to, to start even more small groups, and, and uh, we learn from those who have been doing that for a while. So uh, how do you think we scored? On that. Any guesses? He got 71 in that category. It's actually the highest score that we got out of all eight categories is the small groups. And I'm so excited of the leaders that we have for the small groups, of how wonderful they're going from the participants that are willing to share, open up, and connect through those small groups. Um, there's just one concern as a pastor that I have. None of the questions in the survey ask how many of the church actually participate in the small groups. And from my estimate, about 35-40% are involved in some kind of small groups, and the rest are not. And we really want to have 100% to be involved in the small groups, because those are two wings of the church, as we see, they met in the temple and from house to house. So I want everybody to be part of some sort of a small group, to be involved in some way. Because if everybody is involved in some way, what will be the result? Well, then we'll have discipleship happening on the level that Christ has demonstrated, that he has designed for each Christian to, to experience. The discipleship will take place. We need the support and encouragement of every day. We need that interaction. We need that accountability in the small group and to grow the disciples. We'll learn from each other. Maybe somebody like Peter will ask the questions that we were too afraid to ask, and we'll finally find out the answer. Maybe somebody like Thomas will express their doubts, and everybody will surround him and encourage him in his faith. Maybe somebody else will happen because the interaction does not just happen in that once a week or twice a month, but like Lydia shared, we are in each other's lives every day, right? We text each other, encourage each other, even if it's 12 or 11 o'clock at night because we have this tight knit of the small group. So the discipleship happens in that aspect. Also, the kingdom of God and the church will grow. That's the result of it, right? Acts 2.47, the verse that we already read, praising God and having favor with the people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. 
God will multiply through the small groups. In early 2000s, the church in China, in the country that is closed, considered, grew by 140,000 people a day. A day. That's how fast the, the Christianity was spreading in that country. That is 46 times the number that believed on the day of Pentecost. That is because they used the method of Christ. They met daily. They were in each other's lives. They met in the temple. But they also met from house to house. They encouraged one another. And that's how we will grow. Is it the job of a shepherd or a sheep to make more sheep? Sheep, right? I mean, the, sheep, the shepherd takes care of the sheep. He provides. He might set some atmosphere, you know, put a bouquet of grass, start a fire. But it's a sheep's job to make more sheep, to, to multiply. And it's also, also like an illustration of the body, right? As the body, it functions what the mind tells it to do, and it fulfills the purpose for the day. We are in control of the body because we control it with our mind. So God, Christ, is the head of the church, and we go and do the mission. But, but as the body, I can't tell it to grow, right? How does it grow? On the cellular level, right? Each cell. Sometimes another name for the small group. Each cell is the one that grows. Each cell is the one that multiplies. And that's how the growth of the body happens. So it is in the church as we continue from house to house. That's how the church will grow as well. And will multiply. And it will help to nourish the members. So that nobody will fall away. One time, a senior pastor was looking at some of the, of the membership list and the statistics, and he saw that about every 10 people of every 12 that were converted were leaving the church. So he called together the 12 newly baptized people. He called them to the house. They ate supper, and that, he sat down with them and said, Do you want me to tell you the future? And they said, yes. So he said, statistically speaking, in the next two or three years, two of your marriages will have been broken up and the shame will cause you to leave the church. Three of you will have a conflict with someone in the church and you will leave the church. One will have a tragedy and lose faith and leave. Two will have a moral failing and leave. And two will lose interest and drift away. In two to three years, out of this group, only two of you will be attending a church and only one of you at this church. There was a dead silence in the room. All these wide-eyed Christians were about to say, surely not I, Lord. When one of them spoke up and said, what can we do to change that statistics? The pastor said, you can get together as a group and decide that you're not going to let anyone go. That is exactly what they did. These strangers formed a small group and supported each other through tragedies, through divorce, through conflicts and failing. In the four years, only one had left the church, never to come back. The church went from losing 12 out of every uh, uh, 10 out of every 12 converts to losing just one. So, how about that question that I started out? How do you know if you have enough spiritual strength to face tomorrow, to face next week, to face next month, to face the unknowns of the new year? Will you have enough strength? Well, maybe that's the wrong question to ask. Maybe none of you are supposed to have enough strength all on your own. Maybe you are supposed to be part of the believers, part of the group, that when you don't have enough strength, somebody else can support you. 
When you have fallen down, somebody else can help you up. When you're faced with grief and tragedy, somebody else will give you a shoulder to cry on. When you don't have enough faith, somebody else can share their faith. And we can sing a song together of encouragement. Maybe you're not supposed to have enough strength all on your own. God has, a design, has designed for you to be part of the family, part of this church family as the whole, and part of the cell families, part of the small groups. And they can only carry you if you only share with them. So you have to show up. You have to join one. You have to share with them. You have to help them out and they will help you out. So I have just two calls to make today. If you're not part of the small group, please join one. You have seen several options here up front today. Pick one, call one, look at the Zoom account, join one. Make it a point to do that today, to pick one today, and join that group. And second call, maybe you have been part of the small group in a different church somewhere else. Maybe you have been part of the small group here in this church, and we need more small groups because we want every person to have an opportunity to have this experience of discipleship so our church can fly on those two wings, house to house, and in the temple. So if God is calling you to start one, please talk to me. I will either help you to, to get training or I will train you myself personally on how you can start one. It's not hard. It doesn't have to be formal. I can help you get you the materials that you need and you can start one. So that's the second call. Please do it. Don't just pray about it. We already know the answer. That's God's call to do. <laughs> so please do it. Pick one of those two and do it this week. Amen. Stand for our closing hymn. Bless me the tie it binds.
us inward pain, but we shall still be joined in heart and hope to be again. Our dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that you have created the church that you have designed for us to, to fellowship with, with one another, to have this communion in the church and in each other's homes, and that you have blessed our church, that we are able to do the small groups, and you have blessed us with leaders and participants that come together. Oh, Lord, we want it to multiply here in this church want to grow all small groups from seven and eight to have 16 and 20 and 25. And we ask that you would bless this church with many small groups. Please touch the hearts of the people. May each person here today choose one of those two calls, to join a small group or to start a new one, so that we can give you glory, so that none of us here would be lost but each person will be saved as we see your kingdom coming soon. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. And have a good Sabbath. And don't forget to join us also for the fellowship meal in our Family Life Center downstairs. Thank you.